speakers. Um, so I'm going to each introduce each one of them in the order that they're going to appear today. Um, first of all, we have Natifa Green, who's an assistant professor of philosophy at Gettysburg College. Um, she's interested in liberatory practices and moral psychology, specifically focusing on the notion of habit. Next, we have um, the eminent Joy James. And just as an aside, if you Google Joy James, there's a big picture of Toni Morrison that comes up. I don't know how you feel about that or you've seen this. But um, <laughs> so Google Joy James, you'll see Toni Morrison. But we know Joy James as a philosopher who teaches at Williams College. And her most recent work is In Pursuit of Revolutionary Love, Precarity, Power, Communities, which details her concept of the captive maternal. And we're very much looking forward to the release of her work, New Bones Abolition, Captive Maternal Agency, and the Afterlife of Erica Garner, which will be released in October. And I think we'll get a little piece of that um, today. And last but definitely not least is Chris Seeley, who is the newly appointed professor of philosophy at Penn State. <laughs> Her most recent book is Creo Creolizing the Nation, which discusses the concepts of creolization and nationhood through an encounter with Caribbean Latina feminist philosophies. Um, Creolizing Sartre and Creolizing Critical Theory, both of which she co-edited, are forthcoming. So we're looking forward to hearing from all of you, and I'm looking forward to being in, with dis in discussion with you. And just wanted to say like, how honored I was to moderate this panel and how I asked specifically to be here to be with you all. And so I love that we're able to be in conversation. So, Natifa. Thank you, first of all, to the organizers of this conference and to my eminent um, co-presenters, Crescent, thank you for such a lovely introduction, and all of you who have presented and interacted with ideas in a productive way so far. I am um, happy to be here and look forward to further discussion. I'll start with a historical marker. In December 2020, a silk cotton tree of the island of Tobago fell, on the island of Tobago fell, after several days of heavy rain. This tree was several hundred years old, a massive landmark overlooking the Atlantic, the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. This tree marks an area associated with Afro-Caribbean practices of Obia, and it is known as the site where Gangang Sarah died. According to legend, Gangang Sarah flew from Africa to search for her family members who had been stolen, landing in Tobago in the early 1800s. Gangang Sarah lived a prominent life as a healer and midwife in Golden Lane, eventually marrying Tom, who, in some accounts, was also born in Africa. Tom and Sarah were both enslaved on a plantation at Golden Lane, in some renditions of the story, Gangang Sarah decided to go home to Africa after the Emancipation Decree in 1838. In some accounts, she decided to leave when Tom died. Either way, when it was time to go, she climbed the silk cotton tree to fly back to Africa and return the way she arrived. But instead of flying, she fell from the branches and died. She could no longer fly because she had eaten food that had been cooked with salt. Although the silk cotton tree has fallen, the graves of Gangang Sarah and Tom still mark their memory. Seba is the Taino name for the silk cotton tree, original to the Americas, although it is also now widely grown in Asia, sometimes known as the Kapok tree. It is usually an emergent forest species growing up above the tree canopy, up to um, over 100 uh, meters tall, although it is adaptable and may grow more wide than tall depending on its environment. The seba is a plant and a place because of its massive buttress roots, above ground uh, buttress roots. It's associated with semis, the Taino word for sacred things objects and concepts that could change circumstances and social relations, a link to ancestors and other spirits. Its flowers are pollinated by bats, 
a species also tied to the spirits of ancestors since ancient times. The tree trunk itself could be recognized as a semi or sacred thing. The seba trunk would be used to make a dugout canoe, some large enough to fit up to 100 men. Opias, the Taino word for spirits of the dead, are said to live in its giant buttress roots and branches. And this silk cotton tree in Tobago, linked to the legend of Gangang Sera, marks an area known for the practice of obia, the Afro-Caribbean word for objects and practices that connect present people and places to ancestors in the spirit world. There is some dispute over the etymology of the term obia among linguists and archaeologists, whether it's linked to the Taino word or uh, African terms, but that dispute is beyond the scope of my discussion today. If you look at a map of the Caribbean archipelago, the island now known as Tobago juts out into the Atlantic. And this island is now politically connected to Trinidad, the next island down. And uh, Trinidad is the last island before the landmass of South America. So here at these two islands, now a twin island republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, and the Orinoco Delta region meet and intermingle. The continuity of meaning in sacred practices associated with this tree and the links to ancestors and spirits are my main focus. The sacred ritual practices of obia and the everyday life around an object like a silk cotton tree represent ways that people have organized themselves to affirm human being. A sense of connection to ancestors and meaningful social practices articulate life, even in the midst of the disastrous plantation economy. The 2021 Hypatia special issue on conjure feminism treats conjure feminism as a black intellectual lineage because of the forms of knowledge production and social practices that articulate black life in this political context of the plantation. Um, I will return to this special issue toward the end after a few more reflections on the legend of Gang Gang Sarah. When I think of the symbolic significance of salt in this story, I think of the salt water of the Atlantic Ocean transforming those who were taken. I think of salt traded in a global commerce that invented property rights that, could trans that were said to be able to transform African human beings into a form of movable property. Salt in this story means she was permanently transformed from one kind of being to another. The effect of salt articulates a collective transformation as well of enslaved and free African peoples in the Atlantic world into a kind of being that uh, through a process that Sylvia Winter calls black metamorphosis. Um, quote, the classic example of this transformation, black metamorphosis, is to be found in the Caribbean, Winter explains, as African peoples were incorporated into Western civilization through firstly, the latifunda, the large landed estates of Spain and Portugal, and secondly, and more intensively, the plantations of the New World. These were the institutions which, similar to the encomienda for the New World Indians, functioned as the locus where the tribal African, Yoruba, Ga, Ashanti, Igbo, etc., were converted into a homogenous commodity, into a unit of labor power collectively enabled Negro or black. Salt is a substance that represents the effects of social categories that were invent, invented in the political structure of transatlantic slavery and the plantation societies of the colonial African world. In some versions of the story, Gang Gang Sarah expected she would fly when she climbed the silk cotton tree. One can also imagine a decision to take the time and cause of her death into her own hands. So no accident, in other words. As the poet George Horton wrote in North Carolina in 1828, um, quote, then let me hasten to the grave, the only refuge for the slave who mourns for liberty for example. Exactly how she died is known only to her. 
But for now, in this rendition, for us here, the most striking aspect of this story for me, in my reflection, is not how she died, but how she lived. As with all legends, we can interpret the story in terms of broad global phenomena. A uh, side note, for example, the area where Gangang Sarah lived um, was Culloden in Tobago, which, if you're a history nerd like me, brings to mind the 1745 Battle of Culloden in Britain, the last onshore battle against the Scots, the Highlanders, after which British territorial expansion mainly focused overseas, moving violence overseas. So what could it mean to take the name Culloden into uh, the island of Tobago? Something to consider. The settlers who became plantation owners in Tobago would have been Scots. Um, I'm not sure about Peter, the plantation owner in particular, but that is a point of reflection uh, in terms of the broader global phenomena at stake here. Also, um, if you're interested in the Seven Years' War, um, Tobago changed hands in the Treaty of Paris. That's when it became a British territory. Um, for those of you who read political philosophers of that time in the um, 1700s, it's a significant battle or treaty. For example, in Immanuel Kant's Perpetual Peace, um, and thinking about it from Tobago rather than from the European powers who changed hands can be significant. So that's the global thinking. At the same time, there are more local, um, intimate meanings. And here is one poetic rendition of the story of Gang Gang Sarah by a poet named Lisa Peters. But sorrow cried. Love was denied the day owner Peter came to stay. One look at Sarah, he decided to have her steal her way to Golden Lane. Tom returned to find love gone and followed, his love to claim. But owner Peter had him arrested to execute in Golden Lane jail. When Sarah heard Tom was captured, she made a bad bargain that day. She knew she could fly. And so, for love's life, said yes, with owner Peter, she stay. If Tom was spared death and only banished, she'd eat the feast that was laid. And, biding her time, she agreed to dine, to seal the deal she'd made. But one sad rule for Sarah. For her spirit power to persist, no salt, no salt by accident or plan could dare to pass her lips. And owner Peter smiled when Sarah realized salt was in the rice and fish. And owner Peter smiled when Sarah cried, because she knew she get tricked. However she died, Gang Gang Sarah practiced the healing arts in a place widely known for the continuity of West African traditions a continuity called Obia in this particular place. The continuity of West African traditions made meaning or historical density and structure for human being that articulated space for life. In a system where the transformations that Sylvia Winter called a black metamorphosis or the meaning of salt meant immiseration and death. The political and legal categories that emerged from transatlantic commerce transformed human beings into disposable objects in the view of the plantation, but the continuity of West African spiritual and ethical traditions created important cultural and spiritual foundations in the lives of those who survived capture and the horrors of transport across the Atlantic Ocean to uh, these islands from the Caribbean Sea and across the Americas. In the 2021 Hypatia special issue on Conjure Feminism, edited by Kenitra Brooks, Camila Martin, and Lakeisha Simmons, the editors treat Conjure Feminism as an example of black women's epistemic agency, citing Christy Dotson, who defines epistemic agency as, quote, the ability to utilize persuasively shared epistemic resources within a given community of knowers 
in order to participate in knowledge production, and if required, the revision of those same resources. Chondrofeminism, as described by the authors in the Hypatia Special Issue, is a fabric woven of many practices and forms of knowledge and adaptations. But there are a few signature features of this fabric that make chondrofeminism a distinct intellectual lineage, according to the editors, um, within black feminist intellectual traditions. Brooks, Martin, and Simmons identify four general tenets of chondrofeminism. One, there are consequences for your actions. There are material, communal, and spiritual consequences for one's actions that cause harm. Conjurefeminism also allows for ontological shifts, such as being cursed and or outcast from the communal space, both as an individual and as a family. Two, death is not an ending, but a transition. Three, one is beholden to the ancestors as well as to future generations, uh, meaning that time is conflated and cyclical. And four, spirit work is necessary for our physical, emotional, and psychological health. Um, Camila Martin defines spirit work as, quote, ritual practices of African-derived religious practices that evolved in the new world. Obia, Vodou, Lukumi, Espiritismo, Conjure, and Hoodoo, Candomblé, and others, as well as communication with supernatural entities. The point here is that the spiritual framework of conjuring is not associated with any specific religion, but is a network of various spiritual practices grounded in the veneration of and communication with the dead as seen through the ancestors. According to the editors, black women's practices demonstrate epistemic agency. For example, uh, excuse me, uh, within the text organized by this editors, black women's um, practices demonstrate forms of epistemic agency. We see um, Lindsay Stewart, for example, who cites the grandmother midwife figure, of which Gang Gang Sarah is one example, as a source of medicinal knowledge and agency able to manage nutrition, reproduction, and even generate new forms of knowledge that defied colonial control. At Golden Lane, where Gang Gang Sarah lived, these knowledge practices are infused with traditional African religions and spiritual practices that interact with indigenous knowledge such as the possible connection between the uh, opia, uh, sem and the meaning of the semi, and the evolution or emergence of obia. This is an example of adaptive epistemic agency in the context of colonization and plantation life. Brooks, Martin, and Simmons trace a long history of conjure feminism through practices developed and refined by black women. Gardening for food, medicine, and pleasure, the healing arts, writing and uh, forms of literature, domestic practices, and narratives that express knowledge in the form of oral history or folklore, like the story of Gang Gang Sarah. The accusation of witchcraft is a theme well known to feminist scholars and yes, Gang Gang Sarah was called a witch um, because plant medicines, the ability to heal, empower, and practice various forms of agency over one's own body or another's, meant that plantation society developed hysteria, a term I use deliberately for the plantocracy, uh, a term I use on purpose, a hysteria about poisonings or the things that medicine, people could do with medicines and plants to escape the control of colonial domination. The ability to extend the range of one's options beyond what a dominant patriarchal society allows is a fundamental challenge to the terms of captivity. The political and legal categories that emerge from transatlantic commerce, 
claim to transform human beings into disposable objects in the view of the plantation. But the continuity of African spiritual and ethical traditions created an important cultural and spiritual foundation in the lives of those who survived capture and the horrors of transport across the Atlantic Ocean to this island in the Caribbean Sea. Um, we can see some examples of these practices in um, Zora Neale Hurston's um, anthropological research in Jamaica, where in 1936, she uh, lived in Jamaica from April to September and attended numerous local ceremonies. So the um, Jamaican belief in duppies or spirits of the dead that live in silk cotton trees and almond trees is another example of the epistemic life affirming knowledge making practices that I'm discussing here. A few concluding points. Um, I was thinking as well about the way that Catherine McKittrick considers plantation futures um, in her essay sparked by a reflection on the African burial ground in New York City. In this text, McKittrick treats the contemporary city and the prison in North America as extensions of the plantation. The same logic of uh, dispossession, forced labor, extraction, immiseration, and early death. At the same time, McKittrick also treats the city as a location where new forms of life became possible. Similarly, the silk cotton tree is a site that marks the plantation, yes, and it is a site where new forms of life became possible through sacred rituals and the infusion of meaning-making practices into the ordinary, everyday presence of the thing, the, the massive thing, the tree, that plant biomass where spirits are said to live in the above-ground buttress roots. McKittrick discusses the plantation in a way that links the plantation future and the um, life-affirming practices of black liberation as a palimpsest or uh, a map painted or drawn on top of another map. And this kind of layering is the way uh, that I've been thinking about conjure feminism as an emergent or adaptive form of epistemic agency. I'm partial to this interpretation because McKittrick discusses the plantation to trace the geographic workings of dispossession, but viewing the plantation beyond an oppression resistance schema. In other words, these adaptive forms of epistemic agency include, but are not limited to, resistance. The meaning-making practices and epistemic agency of black women in conjure feminism and other forms of thinking that uh, focus on the emergence of black life, these are not only forms of resistance. Of course, they're inextricably linked to the plantation, but in the palimpsest or the layer of mapping the strategies and practices, like Obia, create possibility conditions for life. So uh, the concluding point here is that um, epistemic agency, or what I call adaptive epistemic agency, involves knowledge-making practices that we can think of as alternative maps, and new forms of meaning that may include resistance, but are not reducible to being forms of resistance alone. I'll pause there. Thank you. OK, you can hear me. Good morning. Um, thank you, Hypatia, all the organizers, all the staff, all the folks, including on this panel, for just the labor, the endeavor, and actually being able to build this. I want to cite, though, two things that stood out to me uh, specifically. One was the Iranian um, philosopher panel, when one scholar from UC Berkeley, unfortunately, I don't remember their name, uh, was talking about the importance of, I had a critique of black feminism, 
and yeah, clarity, I'm not Toni Morrison, <laughs> but I am also a black feminist who's a captive maternal, so if that gets gnarly, you know, if you're interested, we could talk more. But I think at this moment that it was said that the historical black women in struggle offered a template for feminism that had more rigor, I'm, now I'm adding my words into it, and more of an ethical grounding than the contemporary. And I'm saying that not because um, I think that we've failed something as individuals. I think that in a political project or any political project under capitalism, markets develop because everything is sold. And so we came here because we were you know, captured and sold. And so our thinking process, our thoughts, our words, they also become commodities. And the most graphic I could assert here would be what we're all familiar with are the police killings of unarmed black people and how that became a market that was flooded so that people became millionaires even as they became advocates against police violence. And if we don't want to figure out that Rubik's Cube of how our struggles can be bought by corporation, the academy, and the state itself, then we have consented to being in a market and either to be sellers or buyers and perpetual captives and captors. The second thing that struck me was the brilliant panel with the Latin American theorists who uh, reminded me that I'm not a weird isolate floating somewhere, but there is a grounding and there's a depth and there's a connectivity that radiates beyond all political and geographical borders. So the fact that people have said and have critiqued colonialism and imperialism it either inspires me or ensures me that despite our contradictions, particularly being citizens, some of us, or non-citizens within an empire, that we are not completely conditioned to be obedient. Okay, so there's a couple of things uh, I wanna talk about before I talk about the book that's coming out next month. I wanna talk a bit about epistemology. So this goes back to the professor from Berkeley who talked about historical figures. And also you brought up ancestors as well, and that was discussed or brought up on the panel by um, Latin American theorists and activists, right? So it made me think of Ida B. Wells. And I've been meditating on Ida B. Wells for decades um, because as a, and you're gonna really have to time me because there's so much I'm trying to say. Um, Ida B. Wells is an ancestor and historical figure, for me, is a prototype of feminism. But she became a feminist at the risk of her life. And most of us become a be, you know, feminist because we have ethics, we have the desire to have certain forms of equality. Usually we define those ethics and quality or equality seeking within the framework of liberalism. Liberalism was not available in the postbellum era because the war in which we fought, W.B. Du Bois, I believe, says in Black Reconstruction, almost 200,000 black people, women, men, or even, you know, to be clear about it, would have been non-binary people then as well, fought in the war, and this is partly why the North won, or largely maybe why the North won, but afterwards we were betrayed so what you have is a 13th Amendment. I've done a lot of work on abolition organizing, the most radical forms. I think the most dominant form of abolition right now is radical liberalism. Um, and so the entry of political prisoners is something that's happened recently, and more as an image or a simulacra or presentation of a rebellion that we don't do because we have jobs and we want to keep them. But with Ida B. Wells, I mean, there wasn't an the option of retreating to the academy. There wasn't an the option of retreating anywhere. Because in the postbellum era with the 13th Amendment, which legalizes slavery in the United States, you could like not walk, you know, get off a sidewalk if a white person wanted to pass on the sidewalk and be arrested. So the short version is we died at faster rates in freedom than we had died on plantations. 
because we became co-owned by the state and corporation. So we were literally worked to death. And then lynching appears, right, to be the terror mechanism, right, to keep us disciplined as a workforce, but also as a zone of rape and conquest and the theft of children. So this is what I was hearing, like, within Latin. I, like, heard our history, our lineage, and we also share, of course, with indigenous who were also sold and trafficked into the Caribbean to be slaves, right? So there's war on continent. There's war on water when you capture us. There's war on another continent. And it's that war that Ida B. Wells saw and fought in terms of anti-lynching crusade. So there's a book coming out, Lydia Mullen at Colby, the philosopher, I believe, is the editor. Oxford is putting it out in a couple of months. And so I was asked to write, it's a book on philosophers who are women or, or feminists, but not traditionally seen as such. So I actually did my piece on Ida B. Wells. So I linked Ida B. Wells to Bernard Lonergan, the theologian, right? And also to Sun Tzu, uh, the ancient uh, Chinese warrior theorist, the art of war. So when I was looking at epistemology, I thought of Lonergan's um, three-part stages in insight. There's the experience, there's reflection, there's judgment. But when I look at Ida B. Wells, I was like, no, there's a fourth stage and it's action. So the action is what creates the new experience which allows you to go through reflection and judgment to a new action. And it's never an individual, it's a koki to ergo sum, whatever. It's not for me in the captain maternal, I think therefore I am. It's I act, therefore I am. And I act with the collective. And that, again, I appreciate everything that you stated on the panel yesterday. So when I'm looking at the ancestor, it brings me back to the contemporary because I am a recipient of all those struggles. There's no way you would have black women on this panel if people had not fought and died. But they did not fight and die so we could be on a panel at Hypatia. So the point becomes, what is our function? Not what is our identity or our placement in a bourgeois society and elite academy. And the way I've been thinking about it, and I think the first slide is on, is that I always go back to the organizers. I always go back to the people who put everything on the table, perhaps too much on the table, so they don't have longevity. This is the case of Erica Garner. Her father was choked out by Daniel Pantaleo, not solely, but a group of NYPD. That um, video, I Can't Breathe, which some folks, like Frank Wilderson and others, would call snuff porn. And I think you're familiar with that in terms of violence against women and girls, particularly those who are undocumented or who run away from home. And so since they're you know, exposed and expendable, they get caught in these networks, right? And so snuff porn is when you create a pornography in which you kill the female, usually it's the female, quote, performer or captive within it. So I would say that all these killings, these chokings, these shootings, these beatings to death, high visibility black, but a lot of violence against indigenous communities as well, right? And that's why I was asking you about the disappearance of thousands of indigenous women and girls and who's looking for them or nobody's looking for them or why is it that we have, we have the image. We have care, but we have the projection image of care, right? So BLM, Black Lives Matter, we have the signature, we have, it, this is gonna sound horrible, but you can walk out, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> this is like, it becomes the swag of suffering, right? So, you know, the red handprint for, you know, the missing, and like, we are a visual culture, we are a performative culture, we are not a revolutionary culture. In the era of proto-fascism that's stabilizing, we will not survive until we become a revolutionary culture, or create one. And when we do, it will be like Ida B. Wells' time. Like your neighbors didn't want her to live next to her in Chicago, because when somebody come to firebomb her house, they might get the wrong number, right? Or their house might burn down as well. So it's the precarity that I see in the captive maternal, and the refusal of performativity. 
And I also saw that in Erica Garner. So I was living in Harlem at the time when a lot of the killings, um, 2014 was significant. It was not just Eric Garner, he was the first, and it was Michael Brown, the 18-year-old, and Ferguson. And yes, give credit to the people who organized Black Lives Matter, but it was the people on the ground who are working class, you don't even know their names. They're the ones who built the movement. People can create a hashtag, and again, this is performative, and you say all the right things, and we're ethical, and we're conscientious, but it's the people on the streets. I've been to Chicago. You're gonna have to give me a five minute, okay? I've been to Chicago, and I've met mothers. I mean, I've worked with mothers imp impact a family, like, in Chicago, also we, we did it in Brazil, we did it in Colombia, we did, went to different places. But in Chicago, the one that still has an impact on me is the mother was the activist in Ferguson. She said instead of coming for her, they came for her son who was just studying to be a real estate agent. He was apolitical. The dog is barking, she walks outside, he's hanging from a tree. The police say it's suicide, but she's like, his pants are down. There's no chair, and like, how did he even get up there? And so it's the dishonor, it's the degradation, it's the violence. And so the mother breaks down crying, and she walks out, and the father takes up the narrative. And he speaks in this stoic voice that doesn't have an emotion. So the mother is seen as a very emotional, right, because she's having a nervous breakdown. But the way I read it, and I want to leave the room too, but I have to stay because it's not my kid, and the least I can do is witness the testimony. So the father, though, is, is filled with emotion as well, but how he carries in a staccato voice, almost like reading a weather report, what happens to his child is another intervention in our being co-opted and being complicit. So I'm, you know, I'm sharing honestly as I can my frustrations, not with people in this room, I don't know you, but my frustrations with myself in terms of what my capacity is. I hug the mother and I say, let me know if I can do anything. But this is what I say in this book, we can't resurrect dead children and neither can the state. And it was likely, if this was a murder, that it was police enabled, if not police themselves. And so what happens when an empire performs as God that it can take a life but cannot restore it? And why would we be faithful or obedient to such an empire? So when I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking of Erica Gardner. She, her children don't die, but she dies four months after giving birth. And before she dies at the age, I believe it's like 27 or 28, she talks about, because she's low income, the lack of quality health care. We all know about the high black maternal mortality, like it's double that of white, at least double that of whites. And so when I found out that she was deceased, I decided I would spend a whole year only talking about Erica Garner. So if you, you know, there's a jurist thing in, in Sao Paulo, I'm only gonna talk about Erica Garner. If you ask me to do something on campus, which the BSU Black Student Union did, they did that poster, they imposed her over our ancestors, it was only gonna be about Erica Garner. And it was an homage, but then it became an experience that allowed me to have reflection, judgment, and then move to action that created new experience. And so, the action can also be a tax, which is what New Bones Abolition is. And the revenues for it go back to the press, and this is again is about organizing, and if incarcerated people want books, they get free books. If other people have, you know, don't wanna spend their money on that, wanna spend it on food, then the books get distributed to them. So I started with the young sister, Ida B. Wells. I talked, I'm talking now about this text, New Bones Abolition. We can go to the next slide. This is a piece that was given to me when I wrote um, an article uh, for Verso blog after giving a talk at University of California, I think it was Santa Barbara, it was virtual, on abolition ca and ab um, 
and communism, actually. And it was considered to be edgy because they put communism in there, which is fine. It was, I guess. So <laughs> a f someone I know sent this to me, and then it, I ended up putting it in the book, because so much of what has happened with the capture of our movements is the focus on victimization, which actually is real and terrifying. But our agency and pushback, our rebellions, well, our rebellions are prohibited. So that's why you have political prisoners. Like there's a march for Leonard Peltier, Native American, who's innocent but was at um, Pine Ridge. He turned 79 on the 12th of this month. He's been incarcerated for decades. And no president in the United States will let him out because he represents indigenous autonomy, just like it takes the Black Panthers almost having to be dead before they're, they're let out, right? So the issue of autonomy is prohibited. But this is our history, and this is our legacy. We did the deed repeatedly, but we don't talk about it. And that's, that's why I find very puzzling in our theorizing that we know rebellions exist, but we don't factor rebellions. I mean, I can't make it a complete 360 wrap. I'll just say, I rarely hear us address rebellions or revolutionary struggle on the material ground, which is exactly what you said. It's spiritual, it's intellectual, it's a historical gift, but it's almost like we're ashamed of it or we're not gonna get tenure if we do it, or both, right? The next slide. These last two, okay, the first, the captive maternal, and I'll explain it when I finish. I don't have time to read, so I'm not gonna read. I think you already know how to read, so if you're interested, you'll <laughs> look it up. Um, the captive maternal is a gender, exactly because what I saw in Chicago. The mother and the father shared the narrative of p trauma and pain so that the slain child would live in our memory, or at least in mine, or haunt me, whichever, but it makes me do stuff, right? It's also the child. The captain maternal is also the child, it, because it's function. This is a child in Atlanta with FTP, and FTP, it's an acronym that stands for multiple things. Its 20th anniversary is next year. Uh, free the people, feed the people, F the police, right? And whatever else you can come up with FTP. But what they do is they engage with community need. And this is tied to the pamphlet that I was um, sharing on decolonized cop cities and what happened with Manuel um, Paz Terran Tortuguita, who was shot 57 times by Georgia troopers while sitting cross-legged with her hands in the air. And one black woman pastor says that their eyes were closed and they were meditating. So this is to protect, the attempts were to protect a force, which on the cover you can see by the drone is already been bulldozed. And Atlanta is supposed to be the civil rights place because of Martin Luther King and the church and everything. This is again our capture. So the black city government as Comprador is working with the white, which is democratic, is working with the white Republican reactionaries who run the Georgia troopers as a, you know, I'm gonna call it a private militarized um, zone for the proto-fascists that can assassinate someone and neither senator, progressive democratic senator, including Warnock, the black reverend, has said anything against Cop City, right? So the people who take the most risk are the intellectuals on the ground, and now the state has issued terrorism warrants against 60 some odd people, men and women. They were mostly white, so people were saying this is just white you know, invasion kind of thing, but it's like, no, increasingly, I met with black anarchists who had been in the forest. It's multiracial. But they're facing terrorism charges for protesting the building and the, the bulldozing the Wilani land, which is first indigenous, then became a slave plantation, then became a prison farm, 
then became just a green force in a black neighborhood that now will be a militarized training center, which includes Israeli defense forces, to control a black city and push blacks out or put them into prison where you can monetize, okay? So in closing, um, the last image, so this sweetie is handing out food to in Atlanta because there's a lot of poverty and is the daughter of one of the FTP uh, women. And then the last are male captive maternals in Houston when we went to Texas for the anti-death penalty um, conference. And Sundiana Coley's uh, Black Panther who's incarcerated for decades, that's their name there. These two folks, there's no captions. Um, one is uh, Kalonji Chang of Black Power Me Media. I'm sorry, I can't remember the second name. Um, but they're organizing, um, Kofi, organizing in Houston around poverty and police violence. So I wanna conclude by saying, I see our possibilities and our futures as livable only if we resist. I also understand that we will be a fraction of the people who will actually recess. But I do believe, and this is what I said to the young black anarchists when I asked if they had a security strategy, and they're totally traumatized, right, because they were close to Tortuguita, and they understand what assassinations look like. They said no. So having been a military brat, former ROTC, living with an intelligence officer who helped engineer invasions, I think we've underestimated reality. And so our philosophical endeavors are gonna become increasingly abstract unless we agree to epistemology that puts us from the epicenter, which is the surface, to the hypocenter where the revolutionary struggle exists with love, even if we, quote, lose lives, we at least maintain our dignity and our capacity to continue to love. Thank you so much for that. It's, um, I hope this is not only in my head. Yes, please get up, stretch, move your bodies, because um, we have them still. Um, I hope it's not only in my head, because I'm really very grateful for what I'm seeing as, as a really um, uh, connected conversation that I'm looking forward to parsing out with everyone. Um, so as folks get up, I just want to use this opportunity to say thanks um, and just extend gratitude for being here. Um, as Joy said, I'll reiterate, thanks to the organizers. Um, putting together a conference is no easy feat. Um, there is little sleep and lots and lots of emails. So um, thanks to everyone who put in all the time and the effort and the energy. Um, very, very excited and grateful to be part of this space. Great admirers of the three of you all. So, um, so I, I said that I was gonna control my own slides, I'm sorry, but I feel like I should just kind of hang here because that's kind of what we've been doing. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good. We've been having some tech issues at the podium. Okay, all right, so so here is good for multiple reasons. Okay, <coughs> all right. Um, and I'm also kind of, uh, kind of blind, so I'm gonna do my best to read in the shadows, but if that's not working, um, we'll just kind of pivot and figure it out. Okay, um, so this is my title. Um, it's a work in progress. Again, I, I see lots of interesting and exciting and generative continuities with the conversation thus far, so I'm just gonna jump right in um, <coughs> so that we have time for Q&A. Oh, I really cannot see, <laughs> like nothing. <laughs> can you Can you all see? And I can see my words? Win, win, all right, cool beans, okay. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna <laughs> jump in. Uh, so here is my claim. When it comes to black abolition and black desiring for freedom, the work of black mothering and practices of care for black life more generally are integral 
to keeping the imagination undomesticated. I'm of the conviction that black mothering has historically conditioned such possibilities, and in that vein, ought to be considered a locus of what we might call those unfathomable aspirations, in the spirit of what Joy just shared, for a world conducive to black freedom. Next slide. Oh, and Crescent, if you can um, just kind of flag me on time. Okay. <coughs> so I imagine that this claim ultimately asks us to expand our understanding of insurgency, particularly within life's interior spaces. I imagine that in claiming that black mothering practices are central to keeping the black imagination undomesticated, what we're really uh, asking about is the relationship between subject making and possibility making. What kinds of subject making or perhaps remaking practices condition possibilities for generative imagination, for insurgent imagination, for being able to dream in freedom perhaps? At the center of this and related questions, I would like to argue, we find black mothering practice. Next slide. So here's another set of questions. What if, and bear with me, what if we saw the end of property relations, settler colonialism, and racial capitalism in our lifetime? What if we were called to return to, or perhaps begin again, a different kind of living, in our now? Could we answer that call? Would we be ready to bring or bring back into existence these otherwise futures? I consider these questions as central to practices of mothering, other mothering, and caretaking that unfold within totalizing atmospheres of anti-blackness. To my mind, they animate the very ordinary and everyday concerns out of which emerge practices of giving care to or for black life. In such practices, we find alignment with what indigenous scholar, next slide, with what indigenous scholar Eve Tuck calls the desire-based research that on her account is just as necessary to the more damage-centered work of critiquing or resisting the constellation of world-ending systems that make for the impossibility <coughs> of black life. In other words, the work of caring for black life is in large measure work grounded in not yet worlds we seek to build. It operates in and operationalizes the as if we are free, even as a pervading climate of anti-blackness structures freedom as deferred, as incomplete, and as beyond our here and now. So my claim is that the work of black mothering, or the mothering, and caretaking have these generative orientations at its center, exceeding mere resistance against white supremacy and its futurity. <coughs> in this excess, next slide, in this excess, caretaking for black life in general and black mothering in particular will look like rehearsals in the now for what is not yet. And so I invite us today to think about what an attention to this work reveals about blackness in the modality of practice. Next slide. That is to say, blackness not as an ontologized non-being, but rather blackness as a kind of doing and perhaps action in the world, which is also an active and insurgent doing to the world. Attention to practices of black mothering can uncover a meaning of blackness that is not simply the knot of whiteness, but rather a being black that is beyond the dialectics of black resistance against white racial violence. And so in what follows, I hope to show the ways or perhaps lay some ground to think about the ways in which black mothering is animated by this beyond. That black mothering unfolds as if a different future in which such possibilities can live is both possible and probable, despite this our present living in the, what Christina Sharp calls the wake of the plantation. As I will argue, investment in black life, in these interior terrains of intimacy, everydayness and domesticity is more than resistance against black death making 
of the modern statecraft. Beyond that, it is ultimately driven by an unfathomable, yet fathomed, conception of a future that can hold black life. So all of this to say, I am interested in how we might theorize the complexing of the work of black mothering in the wake of the plantation. Work that will invest in black children as if a future is their entitlement and as if an intransient racial capitalism has always already stolen that future from them, right? So both and. This complexity in black mothering work often brings, at least to my mind, Mimi Elizabeth Tell Mosley, right? So this is a figure that I have been obsessing with for about as long as I can remember. Um, right, the mother of Emma Till. Next slide. Her decision to put forth her son's dishonored body as a text of political demand, as testimony, as a witness, perhaps, seem to have been grounded in the following calculation. And this is just me speculating, right? So if they could just see in plain sight what white supremacist violence does to our precious black life, perhaps then there will be a revolution. I often wonder about this calculation about how much audacity and gamble and courage is in it, in a black mother's daring to speculate on a potentiality in a world with no evidence whatsoever to legitimize those speculations, right? So where in 1954 does Ms. Mosley find grounds for this speculation? Certainly not in a national culture that had the wherewithal to brutalize a young child with a violence too gratuitous to ever understand. Certainly not in a nation's failed attempts, or maybe non-attempts, to reconstruct its foundational racial hierarchies. And yet, even in his death, and despite all evidence to the contrary, Emmett Till's humanity was cared for in this way. Through black mothering practice, and out of that care, his humanity made a demand on the future to, at the very least, right, condemn itself for its failure to honor that humanity when alive. The official historical archive tells us of a story about Emma Till's stolen life, about an entire modern architecture that, in Ruth Gilmore's words, next slide, in Ruth Gilmore's words, cast black life for a death that is always untimely, too soon, and, too, and premature. But this story tends to not be my first premise for black mothering, and my speculation is that it wasn't Mamie Till's either, during her son's living and in her son's dying. To borrow DG, Robin D.G. Kelly's words here, black mothering and other mothering seems to, next slide, uh, black mothering seems to, and this is a quote from, <coughs> from Robin Kelly, have more to do with imagining a different future than merely being pissed off about the present. And so as a central modality of blackness as active insurgency in the world, black mothering should complicate our understanding of the intractability of the plantation and its wake. It should complicate Afro, the Afro-pessimist uptake of Orlando Patterson's claim that black life in chattel slavery was a life of social death. Next slide. So summing up her archival analysis of 19th century America at the interstices of racial sentiment, law and subject making, Cynthia Hartman, uh, who I assume were, most of us are familiar with, Cynthia Hartman locates the formerly enslaved black person as follows, and this is a quote that you should see on this slide. Bound by the fetters of sentiment, <coughs> held captive by the vestiges of the past and cast into a legal condition of subjection, these features line the circumstances of an anomalous, misbegotten, and burdened subject, no longer enslaved, but not yet free." Unquote. My question is, in this context of no longer enslaved, but not yet free, what might we say about the foundational premises of black mothering? <coughs> 
To be sure, the work of black mothering and caring for black life more generally doesn't begin at emancipation, right? To the contrary, we can just as easily wonder about the foundational premises of the care work of Frederick Douglass's mother, for instance. Premises that drove her risky late night visits to a son who would grow up to forget her face, but recall the spirit of care that those nightly visits brought to his childhood. My point here is to invite us to think about a lineage of black mothering that across this threshold of emancipation, tethers enslaved black mothers like Douglas's mother to Mamie Till and Rovon Wells, right? Tyree Nichols's mother and Geneva Reed Veal, Sandra Bland's mother. Doing so raises an attendant space of inquiry. Next slide. <coughs> and, and that is, what did it mean to mother on the plantation, entangled in circuitries of black fungibility and commodified being? Perhaps a guidebook to black mothering in the wake of the plantation must return to, to retrieve this tethering to black mothering within the plantation itself. Both tethered by a context of not yet free, both tethered across imagineering for a freedom that isn't not yet, that is not yet. And so I'll move to the next section that I title a caveat, no death of social life actually occurred. And that is a quotation from Ashil Mbembe's work. So in putting together these remarks for us today, I did these online switches and library switches like <coughs> enslaved black mothers in antebellum America or black mothers on the plantation, or the black enslaved family. Nearly always what came up was what, and perhaps all of us here won't be surprised, um, but what came up was what most of us already know, which is analysis of an impossible black motherhood on con under conditions of enslavement, right? Natal alienation, the black maternal as chattel reproduction. To be clear, these gendered violations that structured and continue to structure modern political economy must be documented, right? Horton Spiller's Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book puts this in clear relief as it documents how the center of America's burgeoning racial capitalism uh, or at, at that center was the stolen reproductive capacities of enslaved black women. Nonetheless, I'm compelled to wonder, along with thinkers like Deborah Thomas, Dion Brand, and perhaps even Katrin McKittrick, I'm compelled to wonder about the interior spaces of the plantation, spaces in which something might reside that though intractably informed by the natal alienation of chattel labor is not entirely accounted for by its logic. In other words, I hold on to a conviction that these geographies of black violence and dishonor were also spaces in which under such violent constraints, a practice of black mothering occurred even though it's not in the so-called official record of slavery's grammar book. Next slide. And so I indulge in this speculation. What did mothering on the plantation look like? What might we find if we were able to access the archive of these interior spaces? If, if they could have even be legible, right, to us? Would we encounter first premises, guidelines, undocumented aspirations that ultimately signifies meaningless on the discourses of natal alienation and black female engendering, but perhaps show up as significant other, other kinds of theoretical commitments? And then what I really wonder about is how <coughs> is how the first premises of those interior spaces might help us build our own contemporary capacities for, for sustaining undomesticated aspirations as we mother for black life in or against this the plantation's week. Maybe there are lessons entangled within those monstrous intimacies, to go back to Christina Sharp again, um, of the plantation family. Were they to be recovered 
can help us better leverage our position as practitioners of black hair in a context not unlike that of the plantation and unlike, not unlike its geography of black predisposition to death. <coughs> so, Joy, I'm gonna put you um, at the center of my thinking now, I'm just giving you a heads up. So now, in a bigger version of this project, um, I not only turn to Sadia Hartman's work, but I also turn to Joy James's work because it is work that is forever generative for me. Um, so I tune to both of these thinkers to try to develop methodologies and theoretical orientations that allow us to name these undomesticated aspirations of black mothering practice. My vision for that bigger project is that the slavery's, that slavery's historical archive itself would give shape to what those theoretical orientations ultimately are. But today, because I want <coughs> to attend to my time so we can have a conversation, um, I'll sketch out how I hope to use Hartman's work in all of this. Um, but before I do so, I'd like to just briefly clarify what I take to be the stakes of making present or of retrieving these modalities of black mothering work. So, as scholars of critical black study, it is easy to elucidate, easy is probably not the right word, um, but bear with me, right? It's easy to elucidate how and why black objection overdetermines the lived experience of those who are racialized as black. More to the <coughs> direction of my own inquiry, it's easy to find in the historical archive how and why black objection reduced enslaved black, mother, black women to their reproductive laboring for racial, capital, for racial capital in the Americas. It's more difficult to access black livingness in general and practices of black mothering specifically um, that persisted and still do persist in the interiority of black life, despite these violations and documented foreclosures. This latter enterprise is definitely the path of most resistance to the degree that what it's up against is at best fleeting loopholes of black retreat and reprieve or an archive of silence at worst. So it's for these reasons that <coughs> Sidia Hartman's recourse to critical fabulation as a method promises much to the field of critical black study. How does black study find the human under that kind of inheritance? Next slide. And most at stake in my thinking, what lessons for survival, insurgent aspirations, imagineering, does the field miss when we allow modernities, and this is a quote from Hartman, um, when we allow modernities, documents, statements, and institutions to decide our knowledge of the past, unquote. So in her work, Hartman tunes and returns to this critical fabulation to destabilize the West narrative of blackness. Hers is an attempt to render what is absent, namely the black life in the archive of anti-blackness, a signifying presence, such that the vacancy itself is positioned to tell us something about the black humanity evacuated from a record curated in the service of racial capitalism and Western theory. Next slide. So much of Hartman's I'm sorry, could you go back to the other slide? I think that's where we're supposed to be, I'm sorry. Okay, so this slide. Um, so much of Hartman's method is laid out in this 2008 essay, Venus in Two Acts. And so I'll now highlight some key moments that in that work that offer grounding for critical fabulation as a method. So to begin, Horton Spillers, again, reminds us about the archival silence around female gendered captives in the Middle Passage. Hartman uses this archival silence as an entry point for establishing two things. First, she notes for us that this is indeed our unavoidable starting point. So that, to link again more directly to my own question sets, what we know about black mothers enslaved in neural plantations is, quote from Hartman, little more than a register of their encounter with power little more than what can be extrapolated from an analysis of the ledger and inventory of property, unquote. And then, secondly, she lays out at least 
two options available to us as readers and receivers of this inventory of anti-black violence. Next slide. One, yes, this is where we are, good. Uh, so one, <coughs> right, this is from Venus in Two Acts. One, accept that Fibba and Dido, and these are the two young African girls that Hartman's Hartman uses in this um, essay to develop her method. Um, accept that Fibba and Dido, and hang on, I'm checking my time, five minutes. Okay, we can do this, um, I promise. Uh, exist only within the confines of these violent and dishonorable words. And then two, this is the other option, take up the more difficult task of exhuming the lives buried under this prose. So critical fibrillation presents a path towards this ladder of, um, the, the ladder of these two options. In its theoretical orientation, it is, quote, informed by a different set of values, unquote. And to be clear, is an all theory informed by one set of values or another? Um, can you skip one slide and then skip to the other slide? Okay, good. So in this pursuit of this something new, Hartman offers a key reminder about the ethical implications of what can never be accomplished via her method because it is in fact unaccomplishable. In Venus in Two Acts, she asks, quote, if it is not possible to undo the violence that inaugurates uh, the sparse record of the girl's life, or translate the commodity's speech, then to what end does one tell such stories?" Unquote. For what purpose, in other words, do we look for black mothering practice between the lines of undocumented history? If it is the case that this isn't really about undoing history's violence, what's the purpose of a potential counter history that quote, listens for the unsaid, translating misconstrued words and refashioning disfigured lives if counter history isn't really about undoing history's story. So a counter history, right, can accomplish certain things, but as Hartman points out, it does not undo this loss, unretrievable human life. Forever undocumented in the unofficial history of slavery, dishonor, persons as, as property. This would be an impossible story to find and perhaps even more impossible to tell. However, critical fabulation equips us with tools to pursue what Hartman describes as, quote, a series of speculative arguments, all of which produce a counter history in, quote again, a grammatical mood that expresses doubts, wishes, and possibilities. Next slide. That is to say, even in the face of an intractable impossibility, a theoretical orientation towards what could have been, this is a quote from Hartman, unmistakably marks that impossible story as such. What is irreversible, forever lost in this way, becomes that for which we might perhaps long. Next slide. In the mode of longing, we might even say that what is lost can be made present to human, to haunt, sorry, documented history, and to jeopardize the status of the events, quote by Hartman, that reduced persons to chattel. So I turn to this method of critical fabulation as what might allow us, inspired as we are by a different set of values, to encounter documented speculations about what it would have been like to operationalize black mothering practices on the plantation. Next slide. Inspired by a different set of values, <coughs> we relate to a ledger of black social death critically, speculatively, finding in there what could have easily been undomestic aspirations of black mothers who despite the forever looming invasion of the master's property claim, imagined quite unfathomably a future beyond slavery and in the most interior of spaces mothered children as if they were free, or as if perhaps children needed to prepared, be prepared for being free. Would this counter history be for us, as Hartman says, mothers who practice care for black life in our now, or for them? the black mothers entangled in antebellum violence. The loss turned longing that I want to identify as the outcome of Hartman's speculative narrative strategy describes my own longing for lessons 
for retrieval of some kind of inheritance or lineage from which to learn about mothering black children in the plantation's wake. Next slide. To this end, I want to bring attention to the ethical concerns that Hartman raises for reopening the histories of violated black lives via this method. So she notes that, and I'm almost done, she notes that through these counter histories, we, and this is a quote from Hartman, place yet another demand upon the girls, the women, the mothers, whose lives were already utterly consumed by the demands of the market. To the degree that they make it possible, to the degree that, it, that they make it possible to get close to these past lives, so to us to retrieve some lessons for our present ones, these counter histories, these longing stories, we could even say, quote from Hartman, requires these lives to make themselves useful or instructive by finding in them a lesson for our future or a hope for history, unquote. <coughs> To my mind, this means that the narrative work of critical fabulation is as much about generating an indebtedness to the lives of enslaved black mothers as it is about robbing official history of the last word. We find in the in this speculative register a counter history in these intimate spaces of chattel life to then find ourselves with the weight of this debt in our present unpayable in ways that only an economy of the gift can perhaps articulate. Next slide. So yes, a lineage of black mothering practices tethers us, right, in the plantation's afterlife, to past lives lost to plantation violence, and to mark the lineage as a gift is to also mark it as an infinite debt, to which we might arguably be infinitely encumbered. In a critical fabulation of black mothering practices of a slave woman, a fabulation that requires that their lives be made useful or instructive for us in the present, we accrue a debt from which we are never relieved, as what is owed is owed to lives who will forever remain absent, too long gone to receive what we might have to give them. But across this economy of gift and unrepayable debt, we quote, establish, and this is a quote from Hartman, we establish who we are in relation to, to who we have been, unquote. Black mothers who can neither save our foremothers or ourselves from the weight, weighty obligation to make in our present, in our present time, a time for their humanity. So Hartman is right to find the speculative, the speculative exercise in Octavia Butler's Kindred in the, the counter history that critical fabulation gives us is one that will retether us to an unmarked history only to break us open or break us apart, right? Like Kindred's Dana. It gives us a counter history that refuses closure and instead renders us in the present incomplete. Next slide. Cool. So to conclude, Perhaps one of the most intractably difficult things I've had to figure out was how exactly to mother black children in the context of the United States. I kid, but only a little, that I actually became a black American when my first son was born here in US soil. Before that, I would relate to my blackness primarily through my experience of immigration. So, and so, in a very real sense, my practice of mothering or caring for now two US born black children has been the premier naturalization process, right? It doesn't come with a passport, but it's certainly a rite of passage. Certainly, we might say its own unique instantiation of birthright citizenship. In any event, <coughs> this mode of naturalization comes with the partu sequitur ventrum of antebellum slave law. Next slide. Right, a law that once established, as Spillers again reminds us, that the condition of the slave mother is forever entailed in all her remotest posterity. What are the implications of this forever entailed for those who mother in slavery's afterlife, racialized as black, emancipated, though not yet free? Though we are no longer mothers in bondage, we certainly practice black mothering under a condition defined by the vulnerability to premature death, right? Or so the story of documented history goes. 
But against this official history, we can also inquire in this grammatical mood of Hartman's method and raise concerns as to whether and why this account of disinheritance really says all there is to say. What could have been was the enslaved mother nurturing undomesticated imaginations about abolition and about freedom. What could have been were intimate spaces energized by aspirations for world possibilities, aspirations not simply confined to the world as is. Leanne Simpson writes about indigenous freedom through radical resurgence. Now, there are significant differences, to be sure, between anti-indigeneity and anti-blackness in the context of the Americas. I acknowledge these differences as I bring into consideration Simpson's argument for a radical resurgence in the present for indigenous life ways. Next slide. She writes, and I'm on my last paragraph. She writes, we have first to survive in order to escape, and we have to escape enough, I would, I would interject, before we can mobilize. Next slide. Perhaps as the shadow twin of the disinheritance of partus sequitu ventrum is this inheritance of survival for the sake of something unfathomably otherwise. Perhaps forever entailed in all her remotest posterity is the gift of the black mother's radical and urgent imagination about the end of property relations, settler colonialism, and radical cap and racial capitalism, which is also radical, racial capitalism. The work of black mothering, other mothering, and caretaking have these generative orientations at the center. At the center of first premises that exceed mere resistance against white supremacy and its futurity. In that excess, caretaking for black life in general and black mothering in particular rehearses in the now for what is not yet. It simply must. Next slide. We survive not just to survive, but ultimately in preparation for what awaits on the other side of this as yet incomplete project of freedom. And I'll leave you with my two projects of incomplete but not yet freedom, and thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much um, for this wonderful panel, and thank you, Chris, for reminding me that people need to move. And so while you all are getting up or maybe taking another stretch break, um, I have, if you don't mind, a couple of questions just to sort of ask across the panel. And then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Um, so I'm particularly struck by um, all of your usages of these sort of black women historical figures. Um, thinking about Gongdan Sarah, Mamie Till, Ida B. Wells. Um, and I'm trying to think, sort of like pull out and sort of contextualize this panel within the kind of Hypatia conference as a or one of, or at least the black feminist plenary. Um, so I was wondering about and, and thinking about those historical figures and how we might want to sort of recover them as feminist or not, or captive maternals, et cetera. Um, just interested in perhaps having you, each of you maybe orient yourselves toward the notion of kind of black feminism, like philosophically, like sort of how do you understand um, yourself or your work, and even maybe this sort of uh, relying upon or thinking through kind of historical figures um, as an aspect or not an aspect of your black feminism or r relationship to it philosophically. And anyone can answer this and perhaps that we can also have the other mics to make this more easy. And, and I'll, I'll start like in a low hanging, non fancy kind of way. Um, I, so one of the, one of my signature lines, I should say, um, in like all aspects of my life as, as a teacher, as an academic, um, as a friend, as a mother is, um, if you don't have to invent something from scratch, don't invent it from scratch. Um, because why would you, right? And so my, um, if I'm understanding your, your question or invitation correctly, Crescent, my, um, my impetus to uh, look to 
to find right um, the 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 work that came before me, um, you know, <coughs> in a figure like Mamie Till and Ida B. Wells, um, and enslaved African mothers, as you know, as this, I'm trying to tease on in this new project, is in that vein and is in that spirit, right? There is there is a a, a well of rich knowledge and um, and mistakes and that were made and learned from um, that will be to figure out how to ethically tap into and retrieve, I think could position us uh, to do the kind of work that seems to be so impossible, right? That kind of revolutionary work. Um, I could be wrong. I could be that. It could be that even after doing that, we're still stuck in a rut. Um, but I think it's worth a try. So ultimately, I'm I'm really a fan of like not inventing the wheel from scratch if we don't have to. Yeah, I would. Thanks. I would just add. Um, I could say a little more about the captive maternal in terms of stages. And actually, this is a piece I wrote in 2016, The Womb of Western Theory. So I was just trying to understand how our labor, our generative efforts could be co-opted or captured by the state, hence the captive maternal. And I juxtapose in the opening of it um, an Iraqi feminist who came to the US, kind of like Hannah Arendt, yeah, I'm out of a war zone, and now I get to be a citizen in a democracy. And I pose their quote, which I found on a TED Talk, with a quote from the Black Underground, I can't remember exactly the site, but the piece is online, from Asada Shakur trying to get out of the same democracy because of its anti-blackness, its capitalism and its imperialism. So some people come to the US to be US citizens and feel it's a step up. Other people are like, either we have to completely re-engineer this or we will end up being buried by it, either emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, or in a prison, or physically in the ground, right? So I was wondering, well, how could these both be refugees at the same time? And so it goes on, and as I, people, you know, an editor was looking at it, it was in carceral notebooks, and they were like, what's the gender here because you haven't mentioned any and then i realized like 40 pages out or in that i hadn't put a gender and that's the first time i was like oh this is an ungendered entity right because it's tied to function and it's not tied to personal identity or social standing or marker it's what you do and so then, as more people ask, I started to think about stages. The first being caretaking. And we've talked a lot about care and caretaking, I believe, at this conference. Um, the second would be protest. And we've talked about protesting as well. The third would be movement making. If you say BLM, that's considered to be a movement by most. But that's questioned by some. But from there, there would be a move to Maranaj. And I heard Maranaj yesterday. I didn't go to every panel, couldn't I? Because they coexist, they happen at the same time. But that's the first time I heard Maroon and Maranaj, I believe, at Hypatia, me personally. And the whole concept, historically, of the Maroon, right, is the flight from the captor off the plantation. Indigenous, African, some Irish, if they were fleeing. But you would understand it's a war to be a captive means there was a war that got you captured. And we talk about captives a lot, but we don't talk about the captor as if we fear to name them, right? So Mara Naj, and then the last, last stage I realized when I was thinking about it in terms of Attica, which is considered to be all male, but there were people in Attica prison in the rebellion that happened after George Jackson was assassinated in a prison in August, that's why they call it Black August, Nat Turner, there's a lot of people who did things. Um, in September in New York Attica, um, hostages were taken. The people inside were demanding human rights. Don't call me boy, don't call me the N-word. 
don't have me labor for 27 cents an hour, et cetera, et cetera. They went from being captive caretakers because as trustees, they were reproducing the prison. And that's what I was trying to talk about in the womb of, cap of um, Western theory, that we become the foundation and the structure for the empire. If we don't show up for work, it's like the people at Starbucks, I think you're unionized here, but in other places, right? If you don't show up for work, how do the trains run on time? How does anything run on time, right? So our care to reproduce our families, to feed ourselves, to have stability, actually emboldens and stabilizes the empire itself because we're working for it. Either we're coerced or we're volunteering, whatever, but it's the only gig we think is possible, so we reproduce it. So the trustees were running the prison. They didn't have enough guards to run the prison. The trustees were cooking. They were doing the cleaning. They were doing the laundry. They were doing the gardening. All that domestic work that we see as feminized and a quote, all male zone, they were doing the same labor. You can't have the prison without the prisoners stabilizing the prison by working for it and in it. The second thing is they protest. Don't call me all these things that I listed before. I'm human. That was, you know, obviously they did, there was an agreement on that. Their protest transitions to a movement. The movement manifests as marinage when they take over the prison and they have hostages who are guards. And as I said, what follows marinage because autonomy is prohibited by the state is war. So as I said, I grew up in a military family. They took military surplus from Vietnam. They gave it to the National Guard in New York. They shot through the white hostages to kill largely the black and brown rebels. And after they retook the prison, or Sami Burton's book is coming about um, from UC, right? University, California Press. They tortured and murdered additional people. The guard, the troopers, or this, yeah, it was the National Guard, gave the prison back to the prison guards, and the prison guards ran their whole gauntlet, like strip people, sexual abuse under enslavement, either prison enslavement or plantation, everybody is raped. It's not gender-based, right? It's not age-based. So additional people die because they're tortured and they're killed, they're buried. And this, these are the cycles in a war. It doesn't end until you end the war. The, the question I find is whether or not we want to end the war. Because you can't, there's no way you could end the war and just go on with your everyday life. That's not how it works. And so I'm interested in the absence of discussion of this. I don't expect anybody to do anything, but I'm waiting to hear people talk about it. But it feels, you know, if you're going to talk about everything, it's always in a context. But war disappears. And at one point, the traditional or conventional or the celebratory celebrity, I'll call them abolitionists, were talking about um, what is that? Do you remember that phrase that everybody was saying? Non reformist reforms. And then I wrote a, you know, an article that said that's an oxymoron. That's not real. But they, like, people doubled down on it. Yeah, non reformist reforms. And I was like, is that, yeah, it's a real thing. And I was like, okay. So then. <laughs> What followed that is a bunch of people, and I'm not on front lines, right? I mean, I'll be honest, like in my 20s, I would go to Latin America where they were doing desk watch stuff, and I saw stuff, like by visiting like Salvadorans and refugee camps who'd been macheted by the Contras that the US was paying for. And that still happens around the globe. But the things now, old sedentary prof, I don't go anywhere. But I talk to people who do stuff, and they're saying this is a war scenario. But now the same folks who said non-reformist reforms are now saying it's war. And now I'm like, how, did that just get captured too? And that's why I've been emphasizing the engagement, not to be on the front line, because not everybody should be there because you mess stuff up if you don't know what you're doing, but to understand that the front line needs your support. 
You, I mean, you can't let 66 people do seven to life for terrorism because they started a bail fund or they had a protest to keep a force from being demolished. And once we agree to the terms of the state that violence is legit and we call for non-reformist reforms or we call for like, it's a war, but it's a rhetorical statement, then we are stuck in the zone of performativity. Um, yeah, are there questions here from the audience? Hi everyone, thank you for this incredible panel. Um, I have a question for Chris. Um, and for those who don't know me, I'm Sarur from the University of Memphis. Chris, I'm interested in putting your talk in conversation with the last plenary panel from yesterday, um, the decolonial feminism in Latin America panel, because there was a lot of talk there about the coloniality of the archive, the coloniality of the university, and by extension of academia. Um, yeah, the panelists unpacked that very well for us, so I don't think it bears further contextualization for me right now, but um, I was wondering what you thought those forms, those strands of discourse might do for your project, particularly your use of Hartman and y your um, intention to, or your alignment to going into the archive and exploring the interiority of black motherhood in the context of academic archives, you know, all these like colonial matrices of knowledge production that we've been talking about. What do you think, how would you navigate that and what do you think that would do for your project? Is it on? It's on, okay. Thank you for that question, Soror. Um, um, and, and for you know asking us to make these connections because that's I think the whole point of us being here together for this long for this sustained period right to kind of pull together some threads um, yeah I also um, you know uh, had some spidey senses tingling during yesterday afternoon's panel um, and one thing in um, particular uh, stood out for me um, and I believe it was the uh, speaker number three, um, if I'm remembering correctly, um, where, um, you know, the, the idea of, um, <coughs> the idea of, of communities are sort of beginning their work with a, with this, with a first premise that there are, there are, there is, there is knowledge there um, that is, that is, that remains, or though that has remained um, inaccessible or non-legible, um, but not because it's not there, but because our theoretical commitments, our political commitments, um, the concep conceptions of the world and ourselves that we inherit from coloniality um, is such that uh, we've become convinced that there's no there there. Right, and so once we, once we move beyond that 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 sort of world orientation, and replace it with, uh, no, there are things there 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 are things that um, there are knowledges uh, that can be retrieved. There's a as we have always done, right, and so that work of just sort of, um, you know, the logistics of setting the stage to make those conversations possible. Um, I find exciting and generative. I don't know what it would mean for somebody like me to do that um, in an ethical way, because that's certainly not how I was trained. Um, but I'd be very interested in engaging with work of that nature um, uh, as, as, as a mode of inspiration. So I, I don't know if, if that answers all of your question, but hopefully it, it answers at least, it begins to answer your, your question. But that, that, um, that piece of yesterday's conversation um, definitely, definitely stood out for me. I have in the margins of, margins of my notes, remembering our mothers. 
um, which, you know, sometimes it's difficult to do given the coloniality of the archive. So. I would also love to throw myself in the queue of questions. Thank you so much for a wonderful, inspiring panel, especially uh, all your ideas about not only a critique of the present, but also the possibility of futurity or thinking about the future. Uh, what I found really interesting was what each of you offered in terms of epistemology. Uh, starting with Latifa and the agency of uh, the adoptive agency, uh, which was which is really interesting concept. Uh, my question for you is that what what do you think about the agency of the tree in this situation? And if you could elaborate a little bit on that. And also, um, I really enjoyed your critique of uh, performativity, Joy. Uh, it's just so important, uh, especially at the age of um, globalization and media and so on. Uh, but you, your uh, move towards epistemology was talking about epistemology of action, action as a text. However, yeah, sorry. Did you hear me? Uh, yeah, action as a text. However, action as a text is always mediated, right? Is always mediated, and I was wondering how you kind of explain that mediation. And my question for the last speaker, I'm sorry, I, did, I forgot your name, yes. Because uh, is what is your critique of the promise of care? Because the promise is always suspending the future, right? And I was wondering if, what, what, what is your critique of? I, I understand it's wonderful to hear about the kind of undomesticating radical motherhood, which is really wonderful, interesting. However, I, the promise of care, when you use that concept, I, I always ask, what is the promise and what kind of future? Because always in the promise, the future is suspended, right? So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I made the tree uh, central um, a pillar of my thinking because the way that I thought about it when I learned the news that it fell um, is that it drowned. The tree drowned after heavy rains and also being a forest um, species and losing its um, way of being in the context of other um, life forms. Um, it was living in a way that um, it couldn't survive. Um, and since ancient times, the, the, the way that sacred objects or even um, life forms that have particular kinds of meaning, the way that they function is that they, um, they organize um, the world. And in organizing the world, I'll call that epistemology. Um, naming um, different kinds of objects, whether sacred or everyday, or in the blend of sacred and everyday, which I think the silk cotton tree is, um, it has its ritual significance as well as its ordinary everyday functions for shade and um, practical functions like the canoe and the fruit. Uh, it's called the silk cotton tree because there are threads that you can use to make, um, you know, like to stuff pillows and mattresses and things like that. So um, there are many ways that its function in the world of beings includes us and so in that particular spot in Golden Lane it lost its uh, balance or its interactive healthier way of being able to breathe enough from its roots with like overdevelopment and paving so in with the lack of oxygen access to oxygen and too much water the roots drowned 
Yeah, and I would say, I mean, people might not know that this is someone who loves plant form and nurtures them and creates beauty and recognizes all these formations. It's a life force, and so I, I've just met you, but <laughs> I figured that one out, and it was really <laughs> comforting to know. Um, like, we're not the only species, right, who should be able to survive this. Um, so thank you for your question, and I'm, I'm not gonna push back, I'm just gonna answer it. This is probably gonna be like a pushback. Um, no, I would say that what I do now in academia, yeah, because I don't, I'm not, I'm tenured, so whatever, I do what I want, I, I teach my classes, I do what I want. But um, I would say that these things that I brought are texts. And they will be mediated by people who read them. And some people are like not interested and won't read it at all. Um, this one loves bookmarks, kind of not knowing that but figuring it out. So this is a bookmark, and it's based on um, work we did. It's called Engage, Theorizing Indigenous, African slash Black, and Afro-Indigenous Futures. And then there's a QR code on the back that would take you to all these round tables of indigenous folks talking about pedagogy, Don Wooten, who is the whistleblower for the womb collector, forced hysterectomies for women and, and girls who were in ice camps. They were told, you can see your kids, but you're gonna have to like go to the hospital first and let us take your uterus. So what we did is we took these workshop round tables, Frank Wilderson, Salama Terefe, talking about Afro-pessimism, um, talking about pedagogies, and we created this bookmark as I see it as a text, that if you use the QR code, you can be in conversation with other people who are in conversation. So I see literature now, and I understand people are in different places and they have different desires and expectations of it and different needs in terms of you know income. I see my work with text now as all being about preserving a certain kind of analytic. And my friends call me the librarian. And I think of it in a weird way like Hansel and Gretel, but you don't want the breadcrumbs. I mean, you wanna, you're gonna have to get out of the forest at some point. So we have to preserve, we have to preserve the analyses and the meanings that go beyond the conventional. And I think it gets a little blurry because with Ron DeSantis and all the haters, you know, we can fight the good fight with like, you can't ban our books. But what I've been trying to say on this platform, they're not even necessary for you to lose a revolutionary thread because the liberals have already captured the concept and made it palatable, which is why they can be popular and paid, all right? No, revolutionaries don't make money. They don't get real honoraria. And they're like just trying to stay out of prison. So if we can't, if we can't preserve their meanings, then we lose the trees, right? They talk, they drown, they fall and they drown. So for years when I was at Brown, and it's, I w it's the reason I left Brown, I anthologized political prisoners. And that was so many years ago, it wasn't popular, they made my life hell. I, you know, said I'm out. But these are the rebel voices that were being obscured. Now they're popular. And so there's celebrations and they're marketed and everything. So it only, it took less than 20 years to have revolutionaries who fought the state to now be fashionable. What is fashionable is captured. And so whatever I do with text is just try to, it's just a reminder, like here's some crumbs if you wanna get out of the maze or out of the forest, but I'm not the author per se. If you look at this, I mean, there's things that we put in inquest, which is Harvard Law. And because it's Harvard Law, people read it. And in some part, I think we helped to get minor, I'll say, how about no part? We didn't do it, it's just coincidence. But last um, month, Rusha McGee, Angela Davis co-defendant, who has done over 60 years in prison, was released. And I think as long as the people on the ground who had no name, they weren't, didn't have Harvard, Harvard insignia behind them, they could protest as they did for over 50 years. 
and he was still held captured. So what we were able to do, and I'll wrap it, nobody could find these files, like at my college or whatever. I only had to call the Harvard people, because of the law school, and say, where are Ruchiel McGee's um, legal files? And they're like, oh, here, click on this, because that's capture. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes it works for you. Like, you know, the behemoths, the multi-billionaire club, they have everything already, because they collect everything, they're collectors. So you go in their collection, you're like, can I see this? Then they let you see it, and you're like, wow, Rochelle McGee was actually acquitted of all charges at Marin County shootout because the prison guards killed everybody. Angelo was acquitted in 1972. Rochelle was acquitted in 1973. Here's the difference. Davis had private attorneys and people like Gloria Steinem fundraising for them. And the Soviet Union and the world was watching. And Nixon invited Soviet scientists to come sit in on the trial. That doesn't happen for regular black people. Ruchel McGee was acquitted in 1973 of conspiracy, murder, kidnapping, aggravated kidnapping. The judge did not enter the jury verdict into the written record. That shouldn't even be legal because everybody was watching Davis's trial. You had to like, oh, she was acquitted, you gotta let her go. A poor black person, he's like, you don't. And so for decades, he was in prison, even though he was acquitted. He got simple kidnapping, which is a one to five. You could get out in one year. He was in for decades, right? And so because Harvard and other people on the ground, but I think when Harvard said, oh, we're interested, we'll put this in print, that made it real. So what we print is media, when you publish with Hypatia, that's now with Cambridge, that's gonna give you legitimacy, no matter what you write. But I would assume that in academic publications, most of what's gonna get published is gonna be within the borders of acceptable discourse. Harvard took a risk. At first they kept editing stuff, and I was like, I'm just gonna pull it. And they're like, okay, we're out, we'll leave it alone. And then it, it went out. And it was useful in some ways. I think you have to steal back your literature and steal back your narratives and then figure a way to prolong their meaningfulness until somebody comes to capture them, put them in a glass case, and show them as a specimen in some museum of the past history of black revolutionary struggle. Uh, yes, good, it's on. Um, thank you for your question. I appreciate it because it's, um, it made me think some more. So I don't think I can, I can speak to the, I guess the, 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 the scholarly archive of care that your question might be coming from. Um, but what, I, what I'm trying to say in this project is when it comes to caring for black life, there is no suspension of the future. The, you're, you're, you, you, are, you are making the future now. And that is because you know, in this constellation of anti-blackness, black life is, is um, Black, black life is an articulation of what ought not to be cared for, right? And so, and so in, this, in, this, in this practice, in this movement of caring for, caring for, in this mode of caring for black life, um, it, it's, 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 not a, it's not about a, a, a forestalling or a suspension of the future, it's a, it's a, it's a a sort of irrational guarantee that this future is now, right? I mean, from a simple thing like, you know, allowing your black children in the street or sending your black children off to college. There, how, there is no other way to do that. Um, so, so that is how I'm using this, um, this frame of care. Again, it, it may not fit into the, um, 
you know, where you're, where the, the, scho the scholarship around care that your question may be coming from, and that might be something for me to think about. Um, <coughs> but it's, as I'm using it, it's, I, I don't see it as a suspension or a forestalling of the future at all, so. We have time for one brief question um, and okay. some brief responses. Bueno, uh, excuse me because I don't speak English, uh, but I have a key uh, <laughs> help. <laughs> um, bueno, primero agradecer este panel, estoy muy emocionada um, y todas ustedes uh, las llevo en mi corazón. I'm very excited, I'm very moved and uh, with this panel and I hold you all in my heart. Um, quiero retomar um, esta cuestión de uh, la investigación que estamos llevando con tres generaciones de um, madres negras uh, provenientes de territorios de cimarronaje. I want to come back to the research we have done of three generations of mothers in the context of communities of maroon, maroon communities. Eh, que fue de lo que Selenis estuvo también hablando ayer. Eh, lo, que, lo que quiero señalar es que hay un énfasis para nosotras que tiene que ver eh, quizás con estas preguntas también sobre si es posible descolonizar el archivo o armar otras estrategias de producción de memoria. And this again, like Selenis was saying yesterday, has to do with um, the ways in which we have tried to engage with the decolonization of the archive and the development of new and different practices of memory in that context. Algo que nos interesa fundamentalmente en estas conversaciones, como les hemos nombrado a la metodología que estamos usando, es no un énfasis tanto en reconstrucción de la violencia y del dolor, sino reconstrucción de todo aquello que permite en sus vidas interrumpir esa violencia. So in our methodology that we have talked um, or labeled uh, conversations or dialogues, uh, what we are interested in recovering is of course not the moments of pain or suffering, but of recovering um, all the ways that have um, able to, uh, all, the, all the ways and practices that help resist that violence interrupt. and interrupt, sorry, interrupt that violence. Eh, esto tiene que ver con eh, unas reflexiones que venimos haciendo dentro de nuestro, eh, eh, dentro del GLEFAS, de nuestro grupo de trabajo, de que hay una especie de pornografía del dolor de nuestras comunidades. Es una insistencia que reduce nuestras comunidades a pura dominación. Um, and I mean this because for our communities there, there is this pornography of our suffering that is going on and that, um, una pornografía del dolor. Uh -huh. que reduce that reduces our, our communities to oppression or domination. Estamos muy interesados en rescatar esta vitalidad que estamos nombrando junto con Agustín Lau, un compañero también descolonial, eh, esta vitalidad radical que habita en nuestras comunidades y que permite la reproducción de la vida e invención de mundos por fuera de la plantación. So this is part of our practices of recovering a radical vitality within our communities to be able to envision and gender uh, and project new worlds beyond the plantation. Esto no es solamente algo eh, contrario, digamos, a la tradición eurocentrada que nos muestra siempre la liberación hacia adelante. Nosotras estamos, eh, queremos buscar en estas conversaciones cómo hay prácticas de resistencias que justamente frenan la posibilidad de captura absoluta de nuestras comunidades y nuestra forma de vida. So it is not only, let's say, a um, uh, critique of a Eurocentric vision of liberation forward, because we are precisely looking backward to uh, find and visibilize practices of the interruption of absolute capture that are there and that are still ongoing. Viniendo del Caribe, algo que nos es muy cercano, es como 
hay una persistencia en encontrar pequeños placeres, hacer posible pequeños placeres cotidianos en la música, en las conversaciones, en la espiritualidad, que hacen posible que la gente, a pesar de este mundo eh, de dolor, de violencia, de muerte, la gente puede encontrar pequeños espacios de, de, eh, de vida, de disfrute, ¿no? de, de, la, de la existencia. ¿no? Part of this is, um finding practices um, in s small spaces um, uh, uh, in the ordinary, like in dancing, in music, Sp spirituality. and spirituality, that are this locus of spaces for um, this um, avoidance of capture and enjoyment and joy. Y me gustaría plantear a la mesa cómo, eh, cómo ven en su trabajo de, de eh, crítica al archivo esta necesidad ¿no? de eh, no quedarnos solamente en pensar nuestras comunidades como pura dominación, sino también como eh, en, en, en las pequeñas acciones cotidianas, cómo producen eh, frenos al, al dolor y a la violencia. So if you could if you could tell us how you see this um, need to um, discover and uh, and promote these practices of vitality in the ordinary spaces that interrupt capture and that allow us to um, envision new worlds. So if you could talk of how you see your work in that context of um, yeah recovering of radical vitality in the ordinary. So beautiful. I mean, that was just so beautifully put. Um, I think <laughs> we're sort of at the end of time. So if anyone has just anything briefly to respond to, I think. And and of course, um, I, I didn't add that. Yeah, putting the brakes on the totality of domination as well. I apologize. Yeah. We can go for it. Okay. Okay. So thanks. It's a great question. Um, so in the in the book, I talk about agape, which is love that's disciplined, it's, it's not so much, I mean, yay for erotic love, but I mean, it's, it's another love in which our connectivity is actually essential. And I think out of that care, and I'm not talking about care in a maudlin way, but actually a profound way, like, you know, our trees will fall, but we will plant new ones. That, you know, we will sing, we will dance, we will pray, we will eat together, but we will also defend ourselves. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, I wrote down everything you said, or I wrote down everything that was translated, because um, I, I, I just love that you put into words everything that I'm trying to think and say. Um, so so m my work generally revolves around, and I use, I use the frame of creolization, have been at least, using the frame of creolization um, or Creole communities to try to articulate this, right? So, th so, so, so I am interested precisely in all of this, right? I am interested in ways that um, this capture is both totalizing, but has never had and will never have the last word, right? Um, uh, <coughs> and and that is because, and that is because as a as a community. Um, uh, you know, our, our, our science, our epistemology, um, our uh, creative generative practices um, uh, is all about finding space, right? Maroon space in small places, uh, these counterplantation spaces to do what we have no other choice to do, which is be full, thriving human communities that love and invest um, and, and make our future now. So, so this this project is just another iteration of this. Um, it's 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 me giving myself permission to um, put down in words what ques questions that I've always had, right, around mothering. How the hell do I do this and not mess up? Um, but it's really under that umbrella of um, captured. Captured has never had the last word, and if we look back. We'll see evidence for that, um, and be and be strengthened in that evidence in moving forward, so to speak. I 
am uh, always going to remember how clearly you said yesterday that the struggle cannot be reduced to abortion or uh, the termination of a pregnancy can't be the centerpiece of struggle if we want to call it feminist or anti-racist or anti-capitalist because the um, justice we hope for would be um, linked to reproduction in a much broader sense, health and nutrition and reproduction of humans and other beings in a way that's healthy, like that's the vision of justice instead of a state-oriented right to abortion. And um, I will never forget that, so thank you. And I am also thinking about the ways that the spirits of the dead interact with us in our everyday lives around the roots of the Seba tree and um, how you use the verb frenar makes me um, really uh, inspired to uh, think about one example among many. Uh, there's a book called um, The Things She Carried or All That She Carried where an enslaved woman created a packet for her daughter who was being sent away and she put pecans, a lock of hair, and other significant things into a packet that's been handed down across generations. So this um, packet, this sachet, has become a sacred object and a way to preserve memory, even though the name of this mother may not be known to the descendants who inherited the sachet, which happened on occasion, but the sacred object preserved and passed on the memory. So I would say that's an example, one example of putting the brakes on erasure and total destruction and telling stories in a way that is not only about our domination. There are many others, but that's one example I think of. So if we could all thank our panelists for And before we leave, I think Bonnie has um, something that she wants to share. Well, we have a couple of things. The first is an announcement by Saba Fatima, and um, then I have some words from myself and the editorial team. Uh, first of all, thank you to the wonderful panel. It was super uh, inspiring. Uh, I just wanted to... Um, Oh, I'm Sabah Fatma. I'm the chair of the program committee for FEAST 2023, uh, which is happening in October. Um, I wanted to invite everybody uh, to the FEAST conference. Uh, it's an online-only event. I've placed the QR code up here so you can scan it, and you'll find